There we go. So now we're going to continue with sequences and series. Let me like refresh like where we left off in terms of what we learned about the geometric series because it's rather important. So it's fresh on your minds. So we know that the sum is equal to sigma n equals 1 to infinity of a, which is your starting value, times r to the n minus 1. Uh, we went through and we actually showed using the limit of the partial series that this is equal to a over 1 minus r. And there are some cave caveats to this. This only converges. if the absolute value of r is less than 1. And that's going to be really essential for us. Let's actually write down how we did this. Uh, we found this formula by taking the limit of the partial series. So remember that we defined this infinite, the sum of the infinite series to be equal to the limit as k goes to infinity of your partial series, where the partial series was the sum from the first term to the kth term. Okay, so remember the partial series means you add up the first k terms. So you figure out some sort of formula through that for that. We did that by a bunch of like algebra. And then we took the limit of that formula and it's like, oh wow, you actually get this nice thing. Okay, so because the whole idea is, is that you, you're, you make a sequence that is the sum of all of those, or the sequence, the terms of that sequence are the, all of those partial series. So the first term is the first term. The second term is the sum of the first two terms. The third term is the sum of the first three terms and so on. You figure out a formula for those partial series. You take the limit of that and then you're like, okay, well that converges or it doesn't. And so either the limit or converges or it doesn't. And that means like either your infinite sum will have some well-defined value if the limit exists, in which case it diver uh, converges. Or if the limit doesn't exist, that means it diverges. It like adds up to infinity or there's some issue with it like that. Okay, so this is the reason we spent a bunch of time doing this is because uh, this particular series becomes like the backbone of like all the work that we're going to do. Like it's all going to be based upon this particular one is like why we spent a bunch of time on this. Not because like I have like a, a weird thing for the geometric series, but we just use it a lot basically. So let's look at this. Let's do an example and look at whether something converges or not because you're going to need to do that. Example does... I will get to the question about whether it's useful in programming or coding in a moment after I do it, because yes. Uh, so exa uh, example, let's uh, determine whether the infinite series converges or not. So let's do the first one will be a sum from n equals one to infinity of minus 3 to the n plus 1 over 4 to the n minus 1. Okay, so what's going to happen quite often is that you're going to get some series. This is an infinite series, and we want to know whether it converges or not. Uh, and what will happen is that it really what it is is a geometric series in disguise, and it takes a little bit of work to like figure out what's going on. Okay, so what you... Usually, the way I like to do it is you sort of just play around with, with what you have available off on the side. So you have this, and what you want it to end up looking like is some single number r all to the power of n minus 1. So looking at this, it's a good idea just to sort of write how the numbers would work. 1, 2, comma, 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 n minus 1, n n plus 1. Okay, so I'm going to take my top term and that would be negative 3 to the n minus 1 plus two more terms. Does that make sense? Like, if you look at, if you're going to count from 1 to n plus 1, that n plus 1 is your last term and there's a term before that which would be n and then a term before that which would be n minus 1. 
So on the top you get negative 3 to the n minus 1 times 3 squared. Okay, and then what do you have on the bottom? You have 4 to the n minus 1. What's the whole point of doing this? Well, using the exponent laws, you're like, oh, okay. Well, really what I have is, because they're both raised to the power of n minus 1, I have negative 3 fourths. It, 3, negative 3 was raised to the n plus 1 power. And what I have done is I'm pointing out that negative 3 to the n plus 1 is equal to negative 3 to the n minus 1 times 3 squared. The 3 squared are those two extra terms, which is why it's helpful to, that's why I wrote it out like that. Like if you were to write it out, you'd have negative 3 times itself n minus 1 times. That's all of these right here. And then you have those two other terms, which means you need to multiply it by 3 squared, the two terms. Does that make more sense? Okay, cool. So looking at this, you get negative 3 fourths to the n minus 1 times 9. And that's actually the form that you want it to be in, right? You realize, like, oh, this can now be rewritten as sigma n equals 1 to infinity of 9, which would be your a, times negative 3 fourths to the n minus 1 power. And we know that this only converges if your r, which in this case is negative 3 fourths, if its absolute value is less than 1. Well, the absolute value of negative 3 fourths is 3 fourths, and 3 fourths is less than 1. So we know that this sequence converges. This sequence converges since it can be rewritten in the proper form to compare uh, the absolute value of r with respect to 1, right? And since the absolute value of the r that you found in the pro see, does it make sense? You have to have it to the n minus 1 power. You need your, your number to the n minus 1 power. You can't have it like some of it to the n plus 1 and some of it to the n minus 1. You have to like reconfigure everything. So you look at that single number. That's what gets, gets that is what gets compared to r. Blech. Like my words are not coming out properly. So it's a, it's a bit of algebra. And it's like a real pain sometimes, but you know, it's just what you have to do. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Let's do another one. And then I'll talk about like what this, what this is useful for. Okay, so let's say that you had the sum from n equals infinity to 1 of e to the 2n. Okay, so you have to remember that the form that you want is n equals 1 to infinity of a r to the n minus 1. So you're like, okay, uh, I have some number to 2n. 2n is not n minus 1. So again, I recommend that what you do is you take your term and you work on it over on the side. So I'm going to write this as e squared to the n. Okay. Now, so do you see how it's to the n power? If you were to write this out, you'd go 1, 2, comma, dot, 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 n minus 1, and you'd end at n, yes? We go all the way up to n. Remember the other one, I went all the way up to n plus 1. You only want to go up to n minus 1. So we have one too many terms. So what could you divide by so that your new power is going to be n minus 1? Well, you could divide the whole thing by e squared. Right? If you were to take e squared to the n and divide it by e squared, does it make sense? You could cancel out one of the e squareds and you'd end up with e squared to the n minus 1. Now, you can't just divide by e squared. But what you can do is multiply by e squared over e squared. Because right? that's multiplying by 1. 
So what you end up with is I'm going to leave this e squared on top and this e squared on bottom will cancel with, will reduce the power by one. So I'm going to get e squared times e squared to the n minus one. So I'm just rewriting it so that my exponent is in the form required. If you were to go through and multiply it out, you would see that e squared times e squared to the n minus 1 is the original e squared to the 2n. Right, the e squared, that's what I started with. So I now know that I have the sum of n equals 1 to infinity e squared times e squared to the n minus 1. And now this fits the form of a times r to the n minus 1. Now what we need to do is compare that r value to 1. My r is equal to e squared. And now I need to compare the absolute value of r. So I have the absolute value of e squared. And if you go, we need to now know, well, what is e squared equal to? So I'm going to Wolfram to doing that right now. E squared apparently is approximately 7.38. That is not less than one. So this series does not converge because it's a geometric series where the R value is greater than one. This, all these terms would add up to infinity. It doesn't, it, the limit would not go to a definite value. So we write that down. The series diverges, i.e. the sum or limit diverges to infinity since the, uh, the ratio is, or the absolute value of the ratio, since the absolute value of R is not less. So what you find out is, boom, well, this is not going to really work for you. Okay, we're unhappy about this. Okay. Uh, why are we, why do we care about this? Okay. Um, has anyone ever taken out a loan? We know that the amount of the loan at any given time is equal to the principal times e to the rt, where r is the rate of the loan and t is the amount of the time spent on the loan. Uh, this is how you do continuous compounding as opposed to uh, multiple compounding. Okay, um, That means some computer somewhere has to keep track of how much your loan is worth, correct? Okay, so like, I don't know, let's say you take out a $5,000 loan at 12% interest, so you're going to get 0 0.12 times t, where t is the amount of time, and let's say that t is measured in years. So after like 10 years or something, they plug in t equals 10 and they compute this. Now, here's the problem. E is actually a transcendental number, right? It's a non-repeating decimal. So that's a number with infinitely many digits. Does that make sense? Like this is a number with infinitely many digits. Like how do you have the computer do that? It's the same issue with like having an infinite sum, right? If you have a sum with an infinite number of terms, how do you add all those up? It's impossible, right? You would just keep going further digits, 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 digits. Just like if you kept on trying to add up like, you know, more and more infinite number of terms. Well, at some point what you need is a formula to do this. And actually you can calculate this with an infinite series, which is like the whole point. Like why would you need to do this? It, it gets used in business a lot, to be honest. Uh, same thing happens if you need to calculate sine and cosine. Um, in engineering, uh, a lot of the times when you're like calculating different forces, like things might be done exponentially or with like some sort of trig function. What you're going to have to do is figure out a way to calculate that value so the computer doesn't have to add up an infinite number of terms, right? Because it literally is unable to do that. You need some sort of thing to figure out like, oh, will this converge to a value or not? Boom, that's where this comes into play. So the computer in the background is, is doing all this work and we have to figure out, like basically all of this shows why it's possible to calculate these values with computers. Hopefully that sort of shows you like why in programming or coding you would need to know this.
because you need to program the computers to calculate these sorts of numbers. Person who asked that, is that like sort of give you an idea as to why we're interested in it? Like it it's, yeah, yeah, what's up? Mm -hmm. Yes. For, yeah, so this one will. Yeah, that's what it means to diverge. Yeah, the sum will get bigger and bigger and bigger. It doesn't seem to go anywhere. But, but if you were to look at the partial series of the previous one, you would notice that the terms that you're adding are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and they're not really changing by much. I'll tell you, however, that um, just looking at it like that for the first couple thousand terms or even million terms or billion terms may not be enough to establish about whether it would diverge as you go to infinity. I, uh, there are like weird series where the terms don't end up getting – like even though the terms are really tiny, if you keep on adding, it actually still goes to infinity. A good, a good example of this is – uh, the harmonic series, which is the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n. That is 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth plus 1 fifth plus dot 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 1 over n to whatever n you're going to plus dot dot forever and ever more, right? If you look at that, um, 1 over any number keeps on getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Do you see how the terms that you're adding? Yeah, but this actually diverges. But that's the thing. Even though all these terms are going to zero, it still diverges. So you can't just look at whether the terms are getting smaller. It's 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 more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I get what you're saying. You're saying like, well, why can't we just look at the terms? And like if they're getting smaller, then we know it converges. That's actually not good enough. And actually, um, they didn't really figure this out until the late 18th century. The assumption prior to that was that this thing would actually converge. It doesn't. If you keep on adding up these tiny, tiny terms, it actually eventually does go to infinity, but you keep on adding smaller terms somehow. Yeah, so um, all of your intuitions about how you think sh things should work usually don't apply when you're dealing with infinite series, sadly, which is why like we have this specific example that we're looking at, and that's what we're going to compare everything to. Right, yeah, even yeah. If, if someone put in the chat adding smaller terms to infinity, you would think that because they're getting smaller, that it eventually they wouldn't mean anything. But because you add end up adding an infinite number of them, these infinite number of very small terms like actually adds up adding to something. Yeah. So there's actually some pretty cool things you can do with this that historically were really interesting because there were no computers. Oh, you got it from Ant-Man. That's cool. They're like in somehow teaching people calculus two stuff without really realizing it. Um, you can do a lot of stuff with this to do cool stuff with repeating decimals. So for instance, let's look at 3.26 repeating. So that's like 3.26262626262626 forever. Uh, repeating decimals can be expressed in a rather cool way. So what you notice is that that's 3 plus the first 2, 6 is 26 over 100. The next 2, 6 is 26 over 1,000. The next 2, 6 is over a hundred thousand right because it's oh wait did i do that wrong i feel like that should be ten thousand no that's right so two zeros three zeros five zeros so the next one would be over uh five zero seven zeros one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that would be over seven zeros is 10 billion. Okay. And there's a pattern to this. It's three plus 26 over 10 squared plus 26 over 10 to the, oh, uh, yeah, I did this wrong. 
Okay, wait, I'm sorry. I wrote this wrong. Go back. If this one's 100, this one would be... Oh, jeez, I can't count. <laughs> okay, that's four. So that's 26 over 10,000. And the next one would be over six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Over six is one million. And the next one would be over eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's over a uh, hundred billion. No, a hundred million. But what you notice is it's 26 over 10 squared plus 26 over 10 to the fourth plus 26 over 10 to the sixth plus 26 over 10 to the eighth. Notice the power of 10 each time is getting bigger by two because you're moving over two decimal places, right? Each time it's 0 0.26, 26, 26, 26, 26, right? So each time you increase by a power of 10 plus dot, 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 this will be 26 over 10 to the n plus dot dot dot, right? It keeps going forever and ever and ever. So you can forget about the three for a second and just look at this part. Forget about that plus three. You're like, whatever. Uh, it's going to be three plus some sum. And I guess what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this as... Uh, you can factor out a 10 squared from everything. 1 over... Uh, yeah. Wait. No, we'll factor out a 26, my bad. You'll factor out a 26, and then that gives you 1 over 10 squared plus 1 over 10 to the 4th, dot, 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 forever, right? Higher and higher powers. So you get 3 plus 26 times, and now this is a sigma, okay? Your first term is 1 to the 10th, and then what do you multiply by each time? 10 squared, uh, 1 over 10 squared. So that's 1 over 100 to the n minus 1. So you can rewrite this as a geometric sequence. So what, what's interesting actually is that these repeated decimals, they're just geometric sequences in, in disguise basically, because that repeated decimal is always some number over some higher and higher power of 10. And what you notice is that, so remember this is a geometric sequence because each term, how do you get to the next term? You multiply by a common ratio. Boom. Okay. So that, like they used to use this a lot to, to like come up with like interesting formulas to to like show like oh this infinite digit is equal to like a sum of a bunch of fractions like that's the, sort of the creepy thing about this like the point two six two six two six forever and ever right is equal to one over a hundred plus one over ten thousand plus one over whatever you know all times twenty six like if you if you add up all those fractions you get that repeated decimal. Yeah, with computers, it's like not such a big deal anymore because you would just have it calculated for you. But back in the day, when you would deal with these co uh, complicated numbers, you'd have to deal with it in fraction form because you couldn't just hand it off to the computer to like work with. All right. 